Good morning and good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Shalini Jaisek Azur, and I'm a senior advocacy manager here at UICC. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the special focus dialogue on nutrition and cancer in children, teens, and young adults, where we'll share current understanding, experiences, and current research, and also discuss future opportunities. Before we start, I'd like to take a moment to remind everyone of a few housekeeping rules. Please do mute your microphones when you're not speaking. And also please use the chat box for any questions to the panelists. You can also ask questions by raising your hand during the Q&A session. And now I'll hand the session over to Dr. Steve Wooten, who is Associate Professor of Nutrition at the University of Southampton and the chair of this session. It's over to you, Steve. Thank you, Shalini. So good day, everybody. I hope wherever you are in the world, you're safe and well. And have this. thank you for taking the time to join us today. So this is a special focus dialogue on nutrition, cancer and children. And UICC, together with the International Collaboration on Nutrition in Relation to Cancer, or ICONIC, uh, have brought a panel together today to explore the current activity and consider how we might work better together to review our priorities for research, to improve care, to promote the responses to treatment, and to improve the long-term health after treatment in children and young adults in both high and low and middle-income countries. Just a quick word about ICONIC, for those of you who might not be familiar uh, with us, it was a, an established task force of the International Union of Nutritional Sciences, and it has a number of uh, member participants with World Cancer Research Fund International, the International Malnutrition Task Force, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, the International Atomic Energy Agency, and of course, the International Union for International Cancer Control. Uh, what we're trying to do is to build collaborations between those involved in nutrition and cancer, at the international level, with the ambition of adding value by bringing some leadership, greater coherence and focus to existing activities. We're all working in our own domains and stimulating new ones. Malnutrition or poor nutrition in its broadest sense poses serious challenges to the management of children, teenagers and young adults throughout their cancer journey, prior to diagnosis through into long-term survivorship. Poor nutritional state arises from either the underlying disease process or its tr treatment. And this has been shown to influence the development of cancer, the tolerance to the disease processes, the response to treatment, to susceptibility to infection, quality of life and overall survival. And these effects are most obviously evident during treatment, but we're increasingly recognizing the long-term or late effects that uh, may present once treatment is completed. So very much a lifelong consideration. The first international workshop on nutrition and cancer and nutrition was held in 1998 under the auspices of UICC. And since that time, there have been notable improvements in childhood cancer outcomes, particularly in high income countries, although less so in low and middle income countries. And our understanding of the mechanisms by which poor nutritional state influences the resilience to disease, the response to treatment and outcomes remains unclear, as does how best to organize and deliver care. So what we thought we would do is bring together speakers from the major groupings working uh, both within ICONIC and across the broader community to share their current understanding, their experience and the current research activity in nutrition and cancer. What we're very keen to do is to look to see where there are synergies across these different activities and where there are opportunities for everybody to become increasingly involved. Uh, Shalini has shown the speakers that we brought together today. Uh, I will introduce them briefly in turn. We've asked them each to speak for uh, eight or 10 minutes in uh, co-presentation -pre co format, so two at a time. Uh, we won't take specific questions at the end of each presentation, and we'll try and maximize the time we've got for the panel session at the end. So just to remind you, if you have any questions or any comments at all, please use the chat function, which you can find on the lower ribbon 
of the, uh, the screen. So without further ado, I'd like to start by inviting Professor Mike Stevens, a colleague we're working with in uh, the UK, who's the children's teens and young adult workstream lead from the University of Bristol, together with Professor Ronnie Barr from the International Society of Pediatric Oncology, uh, where he's the nutrition chair and McMaster University. So uh, Mike and Ronnie, over to you. Well, um, thank you very much, Stephen. Good afternoon from the United Kingdom, where although um, it's now mid-April, we had uh, significant snowfall this morning. So uh, sun, summer has not yet arrived for us. Um, it's my pleasure to really make a short introduction to today's important symposium and to say from a personal perspective how much I welcome this ability to bring people together to uh, focus on uh, a challenge which, as you see from my first slide, has really been in uh, perspective for some time. So this, uh, this, this uh, publication I want to illustrate to start us off uh, dates back over 40 years. And it's, a, it's one of the earliest publications about nutrition and cancer in children, authored by Jan van Eys from the MD Anderson uh, Institution in, in the United States in 1979. And when I reread this paper, I, I found it actually of considerable interest because so many of the themes it identifies, um, and indeed some of the themes that he continued to explore in subsequent literature in the early 1980s remain relevant today. Uh, and, and what I hope that perhaps you can see from the slide is that, that the, the abstract uh, makes reference, passing reference to issues such as the incidence of malnutrition in children with cancer, something about the interventions that are required. And, and there is even a hint here about the value of nutritional recovery on nutritional, on treatment outcomes uh, and, uh, and the tolerance of treatment itself. Now at the bottom of the slide, I pulled out uh, what essentially were the key themes that we find in the discussion of this paper. I mean, it's a, it's a short paper with a relatively small number of, uh, of patient observations. Um, <clears throat> and yet it, it draws out uh, a number of things that I think, I think are still relevant today. Uh, and the questions that uh, Jan van Eyes raised were things like, well, what's the impact of nutrition on immunity? Now, I, I think nowadays we are perhaps less focused in that direction, uh, but nevertheless, it remains an Im important correlate. Um, the, the question of uh, the diagnosis of malnutrition and what the marginal description, what the description of marginal nutritional status might be, he describes as being desperately needed. Uh, I think I would describe this as something where we have to have much greater consistency. <clears throat> uh, the, ev the evaluation of uh, uh, changes in nutritional status is important. The design and evaluation so that we can optimize nutritional interventions is important. The modes of delivery, uh, and, and in, in fact, much of his work focused around parental nutrition, which we now recognize is, is something that uh, for, the, for the greatest number of children is unnecessary, but nevertheless remains, uh, a, a, remains a place in some clinical settings. Um, and um, there is also a, a passing reference to the long-term nutritional support of patients with what he described was cancer distorted requirements. It, and he said, it's clearly an unsolved problem. So what I'm hoping we will do today, and I guess that's why everyone is sharing this, uh, the, 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 this, this symposium, is that we'll elaborate on some of the knowledge that's been developed in the 40 years since that paper was published, uh, and that we'll highlight where our research efforts and our, and our clinical efforts need to be focused in the future. So if I can have the next slide, um, please. I just want to spend a couple of minutes really um, looking at the core issue of why nutrition matters in children and young people with cancer and, and what then we might consider from the ongoing discussions that we're going to have during the course of the next uh, hour or so. We, 
we've learned a great deal about uh, nutrition from the focus of nutrition in children with cancer in low and middle income countries. And it's interesting for me to speculate why concern about nutritional status hasn't acquired a higher level of interest amongst the work of the cooperative groups in higher income countries, perhaps until more recently. Um, much of the work uh, that derives or the data that derives from literature builds on uh, research into children with leukemia. I mean, that's very common in pediatric oncology because they represent a, a large and relatively homogeneous population of patients. But it's only more recently that we started to see reports and data relating to children with uh, solid tumors and CNS tumors as well. And perhaps one of the most important things that I'm sure we're going to cover this afternoon is why in the past nutrition and explicitly malnutrition uh, was associated really rather explicitly with the challenge of undernutrition when we know and we've known now for some time that obesity not just in high income countries but also in low and middle income countries is becoming an increasing challenge and the science behind obesity tells us that there are some profound basic mechanisms that are important in, in terms of how cancer develops and uh, how we should effectively treat it in that context. Now it's quite clear from work published in the last 10 years that nutritional status matters in terms of outcome. I haven't got time or, or space to go through illustrations of those reports but, but we now have evidence that optimal nutritional status does have an impact on the tolerance of treatment and on ultimate survival, at least in certain situations. What's also very clear, and Steve alluded to this in his introduction, is that survivors of cancer we know are at risk of uh, high, uh, uh, relatively high rates of long-term morbidity in adult life. And, and it's becoming clear that this may be linked to some of the characteristic body composition changes that we see at least in some subsets of those patients. So if nutrition matters, which I hope we, we will all agree at the outset of this symposium, why then don't we have a more consistent approach to its measurement and monitoring? And why, why are we not clearer by now about when and how to intervene? So down the right hand side of this slide, you'll see a number of themes, which I think will be rehearsed. Having seen the slides, I think many of these themes will be rehearsed as time goes by uh, uh, during our symposium this afternoon. Um, and, and specifically about you know, how we should measure consistently and longitudinally the changes in nutritional status uh, as treatment evolves. How and when should we intervene? why and uh, or how we can get um, measures of nutritional health better integrated into ongoing treatment regimens and how do we link nutrition to uh, the design of interventions both in terms of lifestyle and exercise which are vitally important particularly for our young adult population and for survivors. Uh, I'm not sure whether we will have time, but I think many of you will be, will be aware of the increasing interest in the adult cancer world in the prehab approach. How do you optimize nutrition and exercise tolerance in patients who are about to face important cancer treatment? And is this something that we, it, that we can learn from in terms of our approaches to the treatment of younger patients? And what are the modifiable mechanisms that we should be researching and introducing into our clinical practice? The one thing I haven't mentioned in my two slides, but I think is going to come up a little later anyway, is the whole area of why nutrition may matter in the etiology of childhood cancer. Uh, because we know that nutrition matters in adult cancer, why should it not matter in cancer in younger people? but we will hear more of that later. I'm now gonna hand on to Ronnie Barr, who's going to, I think, put some flesh on those bones, at least I hope so, Ronnie. Hello everyone from Hamilton in Southern Ontario, where our snow has gone. We are officially in spring. 
but it's miserably British weather here with fog and drizzle. So I'm going to pick up on some of the themes that Mike has uh, addressed in his presentation and try to condense these into two sets. The first theme, as you'll see here, emphasizes the need to focus on what we know already. And I'm not going to walk through these three bullet points. You can read them as I amplify what is within. So stick to what works. It really is important to build a solid foundation, particularly among people of multiple disciplines, to use the methods that are of demonstrable established value and the metrics that provide the most useful information. I think as Mike has indicated, we clearly need to take advantage of the evidence that exists already and to build on that. Let's have the next slide. Now, what I'd like to do in these three bullet points in my second theme is to some extent to look separately at high and low and middle income countries, and then to try to condense some of the messages that come out of this discussion. Clearly in the high income setting, the focus with respect to nutrition and cancer has been in that order. Namely that aberrations of nutrition, particularly obesity, relate to the risk of subsequent malignant disease. And the list of these diseases continues to get longer and longer in the adult world. Even now, including thyroid cancer. Who would have thought of that? But in the low and middle income country setting, it is of course somewhat different. Where undernutrition predominates and as Mike has already alluded to, the importance of nutritional intervention cannot be overemphasized. There's good evidence now that effective nutritional intervention makes a huge difference to various easily measurable outcomes, including abandonment of therapy, tolerance of treatment, treatment-related toxicity, and more than anything else, overall survival. Now we've come to recognize again, as Mike has alluded to, that this interaction of body composition and cancer is more complex than we had first recognized. And fairly recently, there has been this recognition in particular of this double burden of malnutrition in families of children with cancer living in low and middle income countries, but not just children with cancer. This double burden is reflected in the obese mother and the wasted stunted child, but that's the background into which new children with diagnosis present. Both Steve and Mike have talked about the increasing recognition of the importance of nutritional status in survivors of cancer in childhood. And let me just draw your attention to the relatively recent evidence that particularly in young people, children, teenagers, young adults with cancer, there is this mixed phenotype of loss of skeletal muscle and gain in total body fat. And that combination leads to the so-called frailty phenotype on the one hand and risk of cardiometabolic morbidity on the other. That is a very bad combination for young survivors of cancer and leads indeed to shortened life expectancy. And there are obvious opportunities here 
for intervention even as early as patients on active therapy, what Mike and others have called preamp. My last point here, I hope, is recognized broadly, and that is that it is important to take at least a three-pronged approach to what we do about nutritional morbidity in children with cancer. No one alone is going to remedy the difficulties, the challenges that we've already identified. And I've given you one example here. Those of you who are more interested can now go and read this article which deals with what I think is a good model of how regional cooperation can tackle these challenges effectively. This organization that comes by the nice abbreviation AHOPCA involves all the Spanish speaking countries in Central America. So that is all of them except Belize and to which have been added the Dominican Republic and more recently Haiti and Cuba. This is an organization that has been highly effective in addressing the many challenges related to nutritional morbidity in children, both with cancer and indeed more recently, those in the general population. My last slide, please. This picks up on the theme that Mike started with. This was our first international workshop, which was held in the city of Puebla, Mexico, because colleagues in that city were among the first to demonstrate the benefit of nutritional intervention in children with acute lymphoblastic leukemia. The tall white haired man in the front of this picture is Jan van Eys, who was a contributor to that first international workshop. And in those proceedings, he left us with that thought in the bottom right hand corner of this slide, essentially posing a challenge to the community of pediatric oncology that we have to do better in the management of nutritional morbidity in our children and not have them suffer severe outcomes that could have been presented, prevented by redressing their more nutritional morbidity. On to your next speaker, Shalini. Thank you very much, Ronnie and Mike, for setting the scene. Uh, and reminding us of the, uh, the challenge ahead. I, we now have two speakers from the agencies. We have Mark Gunther from IARC, who's going to tell us about the agency's response in this area, followed by uh, Alexia Alford from the International Atomic Energy Agency, who's gonna talk about on their work in developing capacity in uh, LMICs. So Mark, would you like to take it on? Yeah, thanks, Steve. Thank you for inviting me to this very interesting panel discussion. So I'm just going to give a very brief outline on some of the work we're doing at IARC on nutrition and childhood cancer. Um, and as you know, IARC um, performs research for cancer prevention and specifically to identify causes of cancer. Um, and within my, my branch, which is the nutrition metabolism branch, we're specifically interested in identifying nutritional causes of cancer, both in terms of cancer etiology, but also cancer survival. Um, next slide, please. So um, within my branch, we're, we're, we're conducting research focused on three major research themes, all of which could be applicable to childhood cancer research. So firstly, investigating the role of obesity, metabolic dysfunction and cancer um, using primarily molecular epidemiologic studies. And we do this to strengthen the understanding of the obesity cancer link, uh, really to identify um, underlying mechanisms linking obesity and body composition with cancer and to identify more specific metabolic uh, parameters or more refined metabolic phenotypes linking you know, obesity with cancer risk and survival. We also conduct research on dietary biomarkers in cancer, so identify novel biomarkers of specific dietary factors, um, primarily through metabolomics, and to explore their link with cancer. And also we're doing work to investigate food contaminants and additives in relation to cancer. 
And then third, a third area, which is also quite applicable to childhood cancer survival is multimorbidity. So identifying causal pathways common to both cancer and other comorbid conditions, for example, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, um, and the role of nutrition plays in this. So um, I think with a growing number of um, uh, childhood cancer survivors, I think there's a growing focus on um, um, what, what might be the determinants of comorbidities among childhood cancer survivors in the future. Uh, next slide. Within our branch, we work in a very multidisciplinary way. Um, so we have um, both epidemiology as, as well as laboratory work and biocistics. So we, we do field work. We, um, we have a number of ongoing cohorts, which we coordinate, for example, the EPIC cohort. We have a number of different studies in low to middle income countries. Um, for example, a study of um, breast cancer in young women in um, Latin America, as well as studies in South Africa and Morocco, uh, primarily focused on breast cancer. Um, but we've, we've built up a very large biobank um, for, for, these, um, for these cohort studies, which we conduct. And this allows us to, to perform laboratory analyses. And within my branch, we have a number of different um, laboratory techniques which we apply to these cohort studies. So for example, metabolomics, uh, the measurement of hormones and um, protein work, um, again, to, to perform molecular epidemiologic studies and identify biomarkers of nutrition um, and metabolic health and relate those to cancer outcomes. And then we have an important em emphasis on databases and statistics and developing statistical methodologies and technology for, for evaluating the link between nutrition, metabolism, and cancer. Uh, next slide. So you've already heard, um, I think, from, from Mike and Ronnie, really the rationale for investigating, um, uh, conducting research on nutrition and, and cancer, and, and childhood cancer. Um, but I think one, one element I really want to point out is that I think some of the risk factors that we know which cause cancer in adults um, are becoming more prevalent among children as well. So it's quite possible that these, um, these factors might also be contributing to, to childhood cancer. And I think one of the most notable risk factors is, is um, high BMI. So we know that being obese and overweight is a risk factor for at least 13 different cancers in adults. Um, there's been very little research on the, the impact of um, obesity and poor metabolic health in, in childhood cancers, but we know that obesity is becoming more common among children and young adults. And in this, um, uh, this work from the NC Risk Factor Collaboration published last year, where they investigated BMI in um, 1985 to 2019 in practically every country of the world, um, as you can see, there, um, there was increases in um, BMI in, in, in virtually all countries of the world, with particular hotspots in, in, for example, Mexico, China, and other parts of Africa and Asia. So this is really a growing problem among, among young, um, teenagers and young adults. And given that BMI is a cause of a number of different cancers, it's quite possible that this could be a growing, growing source of cancer cases in the years to come, particularly among young adults. Next slide. So within my branch, we already have a number of different studies ongoing to investigate the role of nutrition and metabolism in childhood cancer. And um, primarily they've been focused on cancer etiology, um, but we're also now developing um, um, initiatives around cancer survival, which I'll come into in a moment. But for example, we have um, a number of international collaborative efforts to investigate the role of nutrition and metabolism in cancer, to identify causal factors around diet, obesity, metabolism, and the microbiome. Um, we have a number of ongoing projects. So, for example, one of our PhD students, Sylvia Pisano, was working on a meta-analysis of risk factors for childhood cancer. We have a collaboration with, with colleagues in Denmark investigating trans fatty acids and leukemia in young adults. And also we're, we're conducting now some, some work on the microbiome and metabolome in osteosarcoma in Italy. And this is work that's really been coordinated by Inga Huberdex in, in my branch, is really the, um, the drive for much of this research within, within my section. Uh, next slide. So just to give a flavor of some of the, some of the results we're getting from some of our research, so this is the results of the meta-analysis we've conducted to investigate uh, causes of childhood cancer, uh, where we particularly investigated, for example, the role of diet, um, demographic factors, um, obstetric factors, as well as perinatal factors. And we combined data from a number of different case control studies, um, some prospective studies, and two pooled analyses, um, and um, meta-analyzed these, these data. Um, and this is work that's ongoing currently, but, Go to the next slide. <clears throat> Just some, um, uh, some of the results, for example, showing that um, maternal breastfeeding um, lowers risk of ALL in, in the offspring. So um, this has been shown quite consistently from a number of different studies now from around the world. Um, but this meta-analysis shows quite, quite clearly that um, 
uh, breastfeeding um, leads to a significant reduction in ALL risk among, among the offspring. Uh, next slide. Um, on the other side, um, um, we've shown, and um, a number of other studies have shown this, that um, um, maternal coffee consumption increases risk of ALL in, in children. So um, in this pooled analysis um, of data from a number of different case control studies and one um, perspective analysis, it was shown that um, mothers who are drinking more than two cups a day, um, there was a higher risk of ALL in, in their offspring. Um, now, one note of caution around this is that um, much of this um, data is coming from case control studies where there is obviously a higher risk of, um, of bias. Um, and I think this really, um, really highlights the need for possibly more prospective studies, but certainly more, uh, more research into the role of nutritional factors, both in terms of the mother's exposure, but also early life exposure and how that might impact um, cancer risk among children. Next slide. So lastly, just to talk about some of the work that we're conducting collaboratively with, um, with some of the other speakers on, the, on this panel. So um, this is this multinational nutritional biobanking program in pediatric oncology, which we're conducting in, in, in collaboration with Lena Ladas and Ronnie Bath. Um, and we, we published this paper um, two years ago now, which is a JNCI monograph, which really um, was a pretext of developing this, this, um, this biobanking program in pediatric oncology um, and really laid out the rationale for why we need more research, particularly in low to middle income countries, on the role of nutrition and um, body composition, metabolic health and microbiome um, among childhood cancer patients, um, and then to investigate the impact of those factors on, on survival among those um, childhood cancer patients. Um, so I encourage you to, to read these articles. I think it really lays out quite nicely the, um, the need for doing this kind of research um, in the current context. Next slide. So just to give an overview of, of this program, so as I mentioned, it's a, um, a multi-PI um, um, collaborative study. So myself at Inga Hupedex from, from IARC, um, Elena Ladas from Columbia, and then Wani Bar from McMaster University. Um, but we have a number of important collaborators in low to middle income countries. So for example, in Kenya, India, Guatemala, Brazil, as well as in, in high income countries. And really the, 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 the primary aim is to develop a, a resource to study and improve survival for childhood cancers by investing in improved nutrition through this multinational biobanking program. Next slide. So the design is um, laid out in this slide here. So what we'll be doing um, is children with cancer are monitored at diagnosis and followed, followed up over time at sequential points during treatment and into survivorship while collecting, for example, baseline information related to demographics, so age, sex, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, uh, lifestyle habits. So we'll be um, um, administering a dietary questionnaire physical activity and other lifestyle factors. We'll also be performing quite detailed anthropometric measurements, so height, weight, body circumferences, um, possibly body um, impedance. And also um, because we're collecting biological samples, so blood samples and stool, um, we'll also be investigating um, various nutritional bi and biological indices, uh, measuring the microbiota in the stool, um, as well as performing metabolomics and other um, molecular profiling methods. And we'll be doing this um, both at baseline and then again at various time points um, throughout the follow-up. So we'll be able to investigate the, uh, the association between um, anthropometry, body composition, nutrition, and some of these me metabolic um, factors in relation to, to survival among childhood cancer patients with a focus on low to middle income countries. So this is work that we're just planning now. Um, we're, we're, we're already starting to um, uh, develop some of the field work around this initiative. So. Um, we're hoping it will really be getting going in the, in the next year. Um, next slide. And just to, to, to follow up, and um, uh, so thanks for your attention. Um, any questions, please feel free to um, um, ask them in the, in the Q&A section, but um, you can also um, email me or Inga Huberdex, who I mentioned is leading much of this work at IOC. So thank you. Thanks, Mark. So um, I'll follow on now with the IEA's work in um, childhood cancer and nutrition. So next slide, thanks. So the IEA is more commonly um, known for its work in nuclear security and safety, but the IEA actually has a large mandate in human health. And under our human health work sits the nutrition section. So the IEA nutrition section's role is to enhance the capability of member states to combat malnutrition um, using nuclear and related techniques. 
So some of the nuclear-related techniques that we are talking about, um, next slide. Thanks, Shalini. So when we talk about nu nuclear nutrition techniques, we're talking about nutrition techniques that can assess body composition, bone density, and total energy expenditure, most commonly that relates to um, the work in childhood nutrition. So when we, we look at more common um, nuclear techniques such as DEXA or CT scans, but we also um, used stable isotope techniques, which are non-radioactive nuclear techniques so these stable isotope techniques of either deuterium dilution or doubly labelled water can allow us to measure body composition or is the gold standard for measuring total energy expenditure. So the IEA works in these to develop these techniques in our low middle income countries. For example, the deuterium dilution technique, um, currently 61 low middle income countries has capacity to um, perform these measurements and is using it in many areas of the nutrition research, previously mostly in public health um, and now moving into childhood cancer. So I don't have time to go into many of these um, techniques in detail today, but on the website you'll find um, detailed guidance um, material related to these techniques. Next slide, please. So previously, a lot of the IA work is being done in um, public health um, and malnutrition and stunting, um, obesity, and in areas of um, the otherwise healthy community. So this is the um, first work that the IEA is moving into clinical nutrition and to complement the work of our medical imagery and radiotherapy um, units here at the IEA. So in terms of nutrition and childhood cancer, the two main aims of our work is the first one is to support the pediatric cancer community in building evidence and increasing understanding through undertaking this research in LMICs, and then also to build the clinical capacity in LMICs to provide nutrition support for children with cancer in areas of energy expenditure and body composition and bone health. Next slide, thanks. So the major work that we're doing in the research arena is this coordinated research project so the overarching aim of this research project is to understand the interrelating relationships between cancer, body composition, energy expenditure and clinical outcomes in childhood cancer. So this is a five-year research project that commenced in um, 2019 and we will have results hopefully by 2024. So um, I'm great to see many of our collaborators from these projects uh, on the call today. So this is involving 10 countries from um, low middle income and developing countries. And each of these countries proposed individual uh, country-driven research projects. So each is a country-specific project that they've designed to address the needs in their um, cancer centres and brings together both the nutrition experts in their countries as well as their um, paediatric oncology experts. So this is being driven by the countries, but the response they receive support from the IEA in terms of research fund um, and collaborative opportunities such as coordination meeting, trainings um, and mentorship from high income countries. Um, one of them being Erin um, Gordon, who will speak later on today, who's working with these low middle income countries to um, build their capacity. So each of the studies um, had the common um, elements of assessing body composition using stable isotopes. They may be also looking at energy expenditure with doubly labelled water or using DEXA um, machines as well as other body composition techniques such as BIA or the BOD pod. All of the countries look at dietary intake, quality of life, um, and most importantly, clinical outcomes as well. So the different studies are looking at different cancer types. They're all looking at longitudinal measurements to see how treatment um, changes over these stages. And many of the countries are also looking at nutritional interventions. So we're hoping from this research project that we'll get some, um, some more evidence for how the different nutrition management should work in each of these income countries, some toolbooks of ideas about nutritional assessment techniques and different periods of the cancer treatment that are important to um, target with effective nutrition interventions. So we also hope to see lots of nutrition interventions that may be worthwhile researching more and, and scaling up in some of our low middle income countries. Next slide, please. 
So the IEA works in a way that we uh, firstly undertake the research and then we use this research to start building capacity. And this capacity building happens through our technical cooperation project. So the technical cooperation departments at the IEA, they work to address member states' specific nutrition support needs in childhood cancer. So each two years, um, the IEA member state, which currently is up to 181 countries, so um, the low-middle income countries will um, present to the IEA what their priority projects are, um, and we'll work with them to design um, a capacity building project to meet their needs. So these projects may be national um, and address national priorities, or they may be regional or interregional. All the projects are driven from the countries and the IEA works with them to build this capacity. So when we talk about capacity building, um, this may be involved in training. So it may be sending experts to the country to train with them and work with them on either um, the assessment techniques or interventions. It may be sending people from the country to high income countries to on fellowships or to undertake um, PhD or master's degree in nutrition, or it may be running workshops in the country or region. A major part of the capacity building is in the procurement. So this may be buying a DEXA machine or a CT scan or um, establishing a lab. So um, procuring everything from scales to um, gloves to um, all the minor equipment and consumables that are needed to undertake some of these techniques and help them support their larger research and, and clinical needs. Then we also work with um, supplying both networking um, as well as within the country or linking them up with high income countries and providing support and guidance throughout their project and then beyond their two to four year projects through um, whether it's standard operating procedures or um, clinical tools, um, helping them to disseminate through data, um, data analysis and conference presentations. So we try to support them in all areas of um, undertaking both their research and also um, their clinical needs and capacity building. So next slide, please. So yeah, just to sum up, the IEA's um, work in nutrition, um, we're newly moved into this area over the last two to three years. Um, we're currently undertaking this research that we will then use to inform our capacity building with obviously the um, overall outcome is to improve clinical outcomes for children with cancer. So thanks very much. Thank you, Alexia. So if I could just remind you, everybody, please ensure that you use the chat for any questions that you have so we can come back to this uh, at the end of the session. Uh, I'd now like to turn to uh, Rin Tissing and Erin Gordon, who are going to share their experience from uh, work in high income countries and see how we can uh, work better together uh, to support all researchers. So, Wim, could you start, please? Actually, Erin starts. Erin, please. Thank you. Um, all right, so next slide, everyone. Um, so as uh, we've heard from many of the speakers already, you know, malnutrition is not just undernutrition, it's <clears throat> overnutrition. And, you know, the, the, these numbers are, um, to start our worldwide rates, so high income and low and middle income countries. But as we've as we've heard and as we can see here, the rates of overweight and obesity are increasing um, worldwide. So these are the numbers from um, 2019, as you can see, 38 million children under five overweight or obese. Um, in the five to 19 year old range, we have over 340 million children and adolescents. And in high, mid, upper middle income and high income countries, we have about a quarter of children under five living in those regions, but we have about 41% of the overweight children in these countries. So it's disproportionately impacting um, upper middle income and high income countries. In the US, um, I'm gonna pick on the US one because I live and work here and two, uh, because we are second only to China in terms of our rates of overweight and obesity. But um, for us, children age two to 19, we have almost 20%, uh, 18.5% or almost 14 million children with obesity. 
this disproportionately impacts um, children of Hispanic or non-Hispanic Black children. Um, and as has been discussed, and people will continue to discuss in the next couple of panels, you know, the idea of obesity as a risk factor for, for cancer development. Um, recent work from the Children's Oncology Group is looking at the association between um, children, males with ALL, um, and then also further association with uh, how obesity impacts um, the central nervous system in moderate to high levels of involvement. Um, next slide. So in working in high income countries, you know, often definitions of malnutrition are limited to undernutrition. And so what this leads to is screening assessment guidelines, interventions that focus very heavily on undernutrition, but not overnutrition. Um, I can tell you in my, in my center, in my practice at Boston Children's Hospital, we have very, very detailed screening tools and assessment guidelines and interventions um, for people who are underweight, um, but we have nothing for children who are overweight or obese. Um, a mishmash <laughs> um, of indicators that are used to measure weight, height, length, BMI, um, mid upper arm circumference. And as previously has been discussed, um, this idea of body composition, how do we assess lean body mass versus fat mass? And there's not um, a consensus yet on assessment tools, how frequently we should be um, measuring things like body mass um, and what standards we should be using um, to compare not just height and weights, which is pretty standard with things like the CDC and the WHO growth charts, um, but when we're looking at things like mid upper arm circumference or, or DEXA scans, um, what, what are we comparing them to? And then ultimately, how do we standardize our anthropometrics um, both in research and how does that translate into practice? Um, and so now my colleague, Dr. Tissing, is going to speak a little bit about some of the work um, in the Netherlands on some of these issues. Thank you. Yeah, we thought it would be good to um, use some of our own data to discuss uh, relevant, in our view, relevant items. Um, first, we asked in the Netherlands, we asked uh, patients and parents um, about whether there were eating, prob eating problems during treatment or not. And as you can see, it's especially in the younger age group below eight, um, almost one third of the patients and the parents uh, said there were um, uh, oral uh, eating problems. So eating is, is a problem at home. So that makes it, I think, relevant. Even if they are in good uh, uh, nutritional status, still there are eating problems. Next slide, please. So then we said, um, and that was discussed before as well, here we show that nutritional status is important for outcome. And uh, especially underweight, as it's shown here on the, uh, on the graph, uh, patients with underweight, so BMI below minus 1.5 Z-score, uh, had a, uh, uh, almost 20% lower survival rate than patients with a more normal uh, BMI. Um, so uh, they, um, the, 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 uh, but that was at uh, a diagnosis, but also weight changes within the th first three months um, were relevant for survival and uh, for uh, the patients with more decrease in weight had more infections. So patients with malnutrition, undernutrition had more toxicity. Next slide, please. We were not able to show, um, and that was because of low patient numbers, we are not, show, not able to show that overweight was important for side effects, which they probably are. Um, please click some more. Again, again. Yeah. So here we showed how, uh, no, no, yeah, this one. Uh, the changes in BMI during, um, uh, during uh, treatment. So uh, from the left is a diagnosis and to the right is 12 months after diagnosis. And what it shows is that 
Uh, and these are all patients together, uh, like 140 patients uh, during treatment with all diagnoses combined. We saw that there was over and under nutrition um, that um, uh, in the beginning, almost one third was at risk for under nutrition. So a low BMI or decreasing weight. Um, uh, in the uh, more in the adv more advanced stage of the treatment, that was less. So 10, 15 percent had the risk from uh, undernutrition. But it's what's also shown that um, in the first three months, 50 percent of the patients increased had an increase in weight over for more than five percent. And of course, that's okay when you uh, need it, but because we when you were underweight. But it was also the case for the patients with normal weight or even a high rate, high weight. And that was even more in the more advanced uh, uh, disease uh, treatment stage. So we, what, what we concluded from this is that uh, undernutrition, but also overnutrition is an important uh, problem during treatment. Next slide. Um, and what we then did, it was we did we looked at the body composition, and that was um, uh, that was the, were the, the uh, outcome which struck us the most. On the left side, you see the fat mass, and then as you can can see, is that the lower um, the lower lines are the uh, zero um, uh, SDS score. So this the percentage of fat fat mass. So the the lower line is should be normal. And what you see is that all, well, in, in, in the mean of the patients is uh, had a, a large, large increase in fat mass. And on the right side is that you, you can see is the lean body mass. And then the upper uh, line is the zero uh, SDS score. And here you see that uh, the mean uh, lean body mass, uh, uh, fat-free mass was, uh, uh, lower than uh, normal. What what we and what we did is that we um, uh, made three lines: one for the hematological uh, tumors, one for the solid, and one for the brain tumors. And I think that's important when you look at the literature. There is um, uh, there are studies done, of course. Um, as mentioned before, there were leukemia studies, but studies on 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 all causes, all diagnoses combined, are scarce. But then um, the, 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 the different tumors and the different treatment protocols are very uh, different. So I think you can't uh, compare a patient with a neuroblastoma at age three to a medulloblastoma patient at age 12 and a uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia patient at 20. So we have to keep in mind that there are, that there's a, that it's a quite heterogeneous patient population, and I think we don't know, no, we don't know nothing, but we know far too little um, with respect to the differences in, uh, in between the different diagnosis and treatment uh, protocols. Next slide, please. <coughs> this was the follow-up study of the same patient population. What's mentioned before that survivors of, of, uh, of uh, pediatric cancer have an increased risk of overweight and metabolic, metabolic diseases. But till now, all studies were uh, cross-sectional studies in, uh, in survivors. And what we here showed is that the uh, increase in BMI um, already started during treatment. So, and it's um, most, uh, most visible for the brain tumor patients. You see that they have an increase in uh, BMI starting from uh, diagnosis and then increasing even after 12 months of treatment. So that's more or less the time the treatment stops till um, 84 months after diagnosis. So the BMI increase from diagnosis and keeps increasing. And uh, the good thing for the uh, solid and hematological tumors is that uh, it doesn't further increase um, after stop of therapy, but the, back start, down, the downside is that it doesn't go back to normal, so it stays high. Next slide, please. So here I get back to Erin for things we need attention. So, 
So one of the things that I'm sure will come up at the end of this uh, symposium where I'm sure we'll have a robust uh, discussion around uh, what we know and where to go next. And many of these things here, um, we've already been discussing as a group. Um, we could have an entire, you know, week long symposium and all the things that we need to be researching and how. Um, a couple, couple bulleted ones. So um, as people have been talking about the pathophysiological mechanism. So looking at both um, underweight patients and cachexia mechanism, as well as overweight and obesity mechanism. Um, uh, energy intake versus energy expenditure. Um, looking at, you know, how frequently we need to be monitoring um, energy intake and expenditure, and as, as well as the methodology used for those things. Um, physical activity is something that, you know, oftentimes is discussed, you know, when, when able, as the child is capable, um, but looking at kind of robust interventions that really incorporate movement and physical activity throughout um, treatment and afterwards. Um, the role of the gut microbiome, we, we heard um, from Mark about some of the, the projects um, that IARC are doing. And um, Alana Lattice is going to be speaking about this later, I believe, in her talk as well. But how the microbiome changes throughout treatment course, how this impacts um, treatment itself, as well as survival. There's a lot of work there still to be done. Uh, changes in dietary intake, you know, so we know that it's not just, you know, the calories is a dietitian, how many times, you know, families and, and doctors I hear, you know, it, it's a calorie as long as you're eating, it's fine. Um, but we know that that's not the case. And we know um, that that the diet, the diet quality um, is, is really essential to this conversation. The, the role of vitamins and minerals and supplements and complementary products, um, alternative medicines, and those sorts of things is a, is a very, very popular topic um, wide, especially in high income countries where you, know, you can pretty much order anything you want on the internet. Um, and so how these products um, are being used and how they impact uh, patients at all, at all points throughout um, their treatment journey and beyond. Of course, we've talked a lot about overweight and obesity, both um, prevention, and also treatment of, you know, so thinking about, um, again, thinking about how we screen children for malnutrition, you know, if screen positive for overweight or obesity during treatment, so what, what sort of intervention exists for somebody like them? Um, um, how do we translate all of this research into practice? Um, you know, wouldn't it be great if we had some international evidence-based practice guidelines Lines kind of help shape what we were all doing in our different areas of the world. And then lastly, um, this is something I think of a lot, which is the provider and family perception of the role of nutrition and body composition throughout the cancer journey. I think we're very fortunate um, to have such a robust group here who we don't need to be convinced, I don't think, um, about how how important nutrition and, and body composition is. But we do have a lot of work to do in terms of educating families as well as our colleagues, um, whether that be nurses or physicians, um, social workers, teachers, you know, all the people who kind of come into the lives of kids going through treatment, just how important this topic is. Um, and and much is is I would say certainly as more research is being done and we have more evidence to kind of bring to the table, um, that's gonna make those conversations all, all the easier. All right, next slide. Okay, thank you very much, Im and Erin, for taking us through the experience and your work in the US and in the Netherlands. Uh, we're now going to turn to Elena Ladas, from the International Initiative for Pediatrics and Nutrition, IPAN, Colombia, and Dr. Karina Viani from uh, University of Sao Paulo, uh, also from the International Society for Pediatric Oncology, now to uh, explore with us some of the issues around the uh, research and the care issues within the low and uh, middle income country settings. Uh, Elena, are you first? 
Um, I'm first, Karina. Okay, Karina's first. Yeah. Karina, please. Thank you. So next slide, please. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the organization for the invitation to, to speak in this important meeting today. Um, so I'm presenting the research being done in LMICs on behalf of SIOP and IPAN, where I'm the regional clinical research manager for South America. Um, IPAN focuses on building capacity and improving clinical care, training uh, and education and advancing research. So I'm focusing on what's being done right now on, uh, in terms of research. Um, in Latin America, we have um, studies uh, going on in Central America and Caribbean. So there's a study through the uh, AHOPCA, the Central America Pediatric Oncology um, Association, uh, on the role of a nutritional program on delivery of nutritional services in children with cancer in Central America and Haiti. So eligible patients for this prospective study were childhood cancer pa patients under 18 years uh, old, treated in two care centers for pediatric hematology oncology in Nicaragua and Honduras, um, with the objectives uh, of determining the impact of a newly established nutritional program over the nutritional status um, among these cancer, cancer patients newly diagnosed and throughout cancer therapy, and also evaluating the use of nutritional interventions during treatment um, nutrition education, enteroparental nutrition, and supplementation. And also to determine the association between nutritional factors and some clinical outcomes, such as uh, infection rate, um, length of stay, chemo dose uh, reduction, etc. In Haiti, Nicaragua, uh, and Honduras, there is a nutritional registry. So the, it was established um, a nutritional database to monitor and evaluate the nutritional program in pediatric cancer units. Um, in Haiti, there's a, a case series on intussusception in pediatric oncology patients and its nutritional impact. Uh, this study is being led by an IPAN physician. In Brazil, we have two main studies going on. Uh, there's a cohort of neuroblastoma patients. Uh, we're following them from diagnosis up to uh, one year post end of treatment. And we're looking at nutritional status, uh, uh, vitamin D, diet, socioeconomic status, uh, health related quality of life. Um, and this is a multicentric study. And another project in Brazil is a national nutritional registry, uh, which is a prospective study um, on uh, nine hospitals uh, throughout Brazil, which are represented on the map uh, on this slide. So these hospitals represent every uh, main region of, of Brazil. And we are following patients from diagnosis to six months of treatment and looking at nutritional status, socioeconomic status, uh, food security, and costs of treatment. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in Asia, so we have uh, in India a study on ready to use, ready to eat um, therapeutic foods uh, study, which was submitted for publication. There's a study on body composition in patients with ALL. Uh, it's a prospective study, also looking at uh, toxicity. There's a study on severe acute malnutrition and a SIOP. Um, project, a SIOPODC project uh, with IPAN support uh, that's looking at the association of malnutrition and dosing. Uh, the study is coordinated by, by Dr. Amita Trehan uh, from India, and she's collaborating with Sub-Saharan African uh, sites. Um, in Africa, uh, IPAN is working with countries uh, in East Africa, uh, so Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, Ethiopia, and Cameroon. Um, with a current focus on capacity building uh, in clinical care. So we're looking to harmonizing care first uh, to then start focusing on research, which I think it's a key point for several uh, LMICs, especially uh, low-income countries, that first you have to focus on improving clinical care to then 
prioritize research. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you, Elena. Sorry, I was muted. Thank you, Karina, for that overview. Um, I do want to just underscore Karina's last point about the importance of harmonizing care. Um, speaking to everyone from Nepal and being here for the past two weeks, um, building a site here, uh, harmonizing care and ensuring standardization is really important in order to embark on uh, meaningful research that has uh, clinical outcomes. So um, I wanted to just highlight, um, speaking as chair of the Nutrition Committee of Children's Oncology Group, some of our ongoing research. And again, um, I'm not going into great detail about this, but just to bring the audience aware of ongoing studies. Um, and again, um, highlighting the potential for more collaboration um, uh, just within the US and abroad, um, utilizing the mechanism of COG. So the Nutrition Committee has uh, one open study and one soon to be open study. Um, the first looking at the microbiome in children undergoing stem cell transplant. This was a study um, that uh, some pilot work had been done with a small cohort of patients, of, of institutions in the US where we found that administering a probiotic in patients um, starting conditioning therapy for transplant and then continuing up until day 14 was associated with um, safety, number one, and no adverse events. That pilot work um, led to an R01 funded study, which I serve as PI, and um, we are now are have a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial, which you can see, see the uh, outline of this um, in the study, in which we are actually administering this probiotic lactobacillus plantarum um, in 458 children undergoing a stem cell uh, myeloblative therapy. Uh, stem cell transplant and our primary outcome in this study is the reduction of gastrointestinal GVHD. So there's a lot of biology behind why um, the microbiome actually is linked to GI GVHD, um, as well as why this particular strain species um, may be confer protective effect. What is exciting about this study is um, while the primary aim is a very clinical focused outcome, the study has been powered uh, to reduce the incidence of GIQ GVHD by about 25%. We do have a number of correlative outcomes, um, which I find equally exciting. Um, we are collecting both blood and stool specimens over um, the, uh, up until day 120, so starting at day of conditioning and collecting blood and stool at systematic time points up until day 120. Um, through that, we will be sequencing the microbiome. We are uh, sequencing with shotgun, sequ utilizing shotgun sequencing, um, as well as we'll be looking at um, the metabolome and uh, cytokines. So um, a number of uh, transplanters are leading the analysis of cytokine production and then how it relates to GI acute GVHD. Currently, this study has about 100 and uh, almost 60 patients recruited. We are a, for those of you who know COG and how it just works really slow, um, we are a bit away from our goal of 458 patients, but um, hope to get there in the upcoming few years, about three years. We're anticipating it will take, and um, I think we're going to have some meaningful outcomes um, and really learn a lot, if nothing else, about the microbiome changes um, during, in kids undergoing stem cell transplant. Uh, next slide, please. So our next study is a bilingual telemedicine-based intervention looking to prevent weight gain in childhood ALL. So um, you heard a lot from Aaron um, and, and Wim about the importance and the commonness of the development of, of obesity and the continued trajectory of obesity um, into survivorship. 
in the US um, in children uh, treated on COG protocols, um, about 40% of kids who are a normal weight, healthy weight at diagnosis to become overweight obese by the end of treatment. This is also mirrored in DFCI protocols in which a slightly higher percent um, become either overweight or, or obese by the end of treatment. Some work that um, uh, Kara Kelly and I have done through the Dana-Farber Consortium have found that um, while diet may play a, a role and um, you know, Aaron again alluded to the importance of dietary patterns in uh, childhood cancer, it's not explaining everything. And there may be a component of genetics um, and it, there actually may be a component of the microbiome as well. But um, what we do know is that weight gain, this is a preventable and modifiable intervention. So we recently published a study in February um, describing uh, a bilingual um, based intervention that actually was effective at preventing weight gain during the induction phase of therapy. We're now extending that study to look at um, can a telemedicine, 100% telemedicine based intervention beginning at maintenance. Um, again, I can go into that in more detail, maybe during the discussion as to why that time point was selected, but starting in the first month of maintenance and extending for um, six months. And um, the primary aim here is again, preventing the incidence of overweight obesity by the end of treatment for ALL. What's um, all of these studies have um, exciting translational components. In this particular study, we will be looking at uh, genetic risk factors, um, specifically uh, looking at a polygenetic risk score for the development of obesity. And um, this is the first COG nutrition study that will actually um, build upon an international uh, collaboration. Um, our partner sites in Central America that are participating um, in the AHOPCA group will be uh, participating in the collection of uh, DNA in order to refine um, the polygenetic risk score for Hispanic uh, population in the United States. Again, the long-term goal here is to maybe um, extend this particular intervention in uh, Central America through the AHOPCA consortium we're far away away from that, but we're really just setting the platform to do that. Um, additionally, we were we are looking at um, key socio demographic risk factors, specifically um, food security, which in the United States has been really brought to the forefront in the setting of COVID. Um, we are also looking at uh, factors such as home food environments and how that develop obesity. Next slide, please. And so in terms of opportunities for collaboration, um, uh, from our perspective, again, I think there's more for high income, high income collaboration. Um, I think this uh, provides us the opportunity to garner large sample sizes um, because even working through these large consortiums like COG, like Dana-Farber, um, when you dwindle your 800 patients or your 1500 patients down to male, female, um, uh, age group. So, you know, two up into the age of 21 in the US and Canada, we're treating patients. Your sample sizes start to get slow. And here you've spent all these years collecting, you know, you're very excited about this huge data set. But um, again, when you wanna look at ethnicity then and all these other variables that we know are so, so important um, to nutritional outcomes, it becomes difficult. And I think, um, again, broadening our horizons, uh, broadening our collaboration um, across borders could really help us collectively address that. Um, you've heard a bit about high income and low income collaborations. Um, Mark uh, described this multinational microbiome initiative, um, which is quite exciting um, that, you know, that will be um, started in, within the next year. And again, um, I think there's more collaborations that could happen with uh, entities as IARC and WCRF. And again, one example of that would be the ongoing state of the science initiative within WCRF, um, again, focused on ALL, but um, this endeavor 
which is the first by WCRF to be um, looking, addressing childhood cancer, yay. Um, but, um, you know, looking at the state of the science within childhood cancer and its um, uh, relation to outcomes is quite exciting. So I think that fosters for more research and collaboration. And um, again, thank you. I'll take any questions. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Elena and Karina, for your uh, contribution there. Um, looking at the chat and looking for any questions that you may have for any of our speakers through the course of the session. You can also um, have a large number of panels, so if you can also raise your hand if you'd like to speak. Um, you have a hand uh, function under your reactions button. If you uh, raise a hand, I can see you there, or you can raise your question through the chat. I'm just having a quick glance to see if anybody has any hands raised at the moment. I can't see any there. Shalini, can you see anybody? No? Okay, so maybe while you're thinking of your questions, um, I'll pick up on some of the ones from the chat. Um, we, I, I can answer an immediate one from uh, PB Kuhn, they're saying, will the recording of today's session be available for sharing later? And the answer is yes. Uh, UICC will be notifying you of how you can access this recording uh, for a, at a later date and perhaps share it uh, with your colleagues. Uh, Ronnie, you have a hand up. Uh, would you like to say something? Or you well, have I... a question either for yourself or your panel? No, I have a point to make, uh, Please Steve, and it's about the use of BMI, it, particularly in children with cancer, many of whom, particularly in low and middle income country settings, present with large tumor masses that contribute a considerable amount to body weight. But more fundamentally, BMI doesn't distinguish muscle from adipose tissue. So relying on BMI to determine obesity is fraught with challenge. Many of you will understand that it's perfectly possible to have a normal BMI and an expanded fat mass in patients in particular who are sarcopenic. But even more fundamentally, just measuring BMI in low and middle income countries, particularly those that are really resource poor, is fraught with problems. Equipment for accurately measuring height and weight are often not available. The flip side is that tapes for the measurement of mid upper arm circumference are free, they're color coded, and they're easy to use. So, my message, I think, at this point in the discussion is be very careful about interpreting results from BMI, especially in children with cancer. Thank you, Ronnie. I think we, uh, I'll open that to anybody else who wishes to comment. But while you're thinking of your replying, I think what is uh, really important to note is that um, many of the methods we are using uh, have often been developed for other purposes. Uh, they may be used to characterize different aspects of risk or ill health. And one of the biggest challenges I think we face is actually getting some standardized methodologies. And I'll come back to this uh, specific questions um, to follow on from Ronnie's observation uh, in a moment. Um, if you're done, Ronnie, if you could lower your hand and then I know we can then move on. Um, there are some questions in the chat box. Um, if I just take them in the top order there, there was a question from Dr. Abu Rashid um, around psychological and behavioral interventions, um, actually understanding what are the factors that contribute to disturb, dis disordered eating or disturbances in eating behavior or adherence to care. Uh, would any of my colleagues, Vim or uh, Karina, would you like to comment in response to this question?
I think we recognize the importance of this. Paul, is that a hand there? Is that a response to that or a comment? Uh, there's actually a comment, uh, a, a little bit in response to BMI and Ronnie's uh, uh, comment and following on from Erin's uh, classification that malnutrition is two ends of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. I would advocate that there's actually a third aspect of malnutrition where you may have a normal BMI and that alludes to what Erin said about quality of food. So we well know now that um, there are many patients uh, and in the normal population who are micronutrient, either deficient or insufficient, and the impact of micronutrient on physiological status and what we are doing uh, for our patients. So I would say there is a third arm of malnutrition, and that is micronutrient deficiencies and insufficiencies. Well, I think I definitely agree. I think very often we find that the only patients that get referred for any dietetic input or nutritional care are those who are overtly. Uh, undernourished and have lost weight. And there are large numbers of patients who are never referred on to dietetic care or get nutritional care simply because uh, uh, they're not recognized. And if they're not recognized, they're not diagnosed. And if they're not diagnosed, they're not treated. Um, Karina, are you with us? Hi, yes, yeah, sorry, I lost my connection then a few patients okay. showed up. <laughs> Sorry. Do you have any thoughts around the issues of um, psychological studies that, uh, or the behavioural studies that might help us un better understand why children do not eat so well uh, in response to their treatment and following treatment? Absolutely. Uh, working in the in the clinic is something that you you see a lot every day, and especially when we're talking about pediatrics. There's the whole family involved and the parents. I think it's this is a key thing to to study uh, interventions to so we're able to to really get to our our main objectives. These children, absolutely. Uh, there was another question in here around um, BMI again around uh, the extent to which it's adiposity having a direct causal effect or whether it's marking metabolic dysfunction. Uh, we like to think of uh, indicators, a range of indicators of metabolic unfitness, adiposity is but one, but um, that was a comment there. Does any, would anybody like to comment? I mean, um, Alexia, do you see this in terms of the CRP work? That we might be able to better understand the distinction between adiposity and some of the metabolic measures that you're making? Yeah, so I mean, obviously echoing the work of the IEA focuses on body composition, recognising that BMI is purely a screening um, tool for larger populations. So we know it's important to measure fat mass and fat free mass. And so in the CRP, we're looking at the link that fat and fat free mass has to clinical outcomes um, rather than BMI. So moving, moving from BMI um, and recognising that, yeah, the clinical outcome and BIA as a de uh, as a um, definition of obesity, it really um, we look at BM, um, obesity being an excess of fat mass, um, and the link that excess fat mass has to clinical outcomes, but also the loss of fat free mass and its clinical outcomes. So we don't see the BMI um, has you know it's used as a great screening tool, but on individual patients. We need to look at more about the link that the fat mass has to clinical outcomes or the loss of fat free mass has to outcomes rather than BMI itself. So we see that fat mass and fat free mass has more um, relationship to these metabolic factors rather than BMI because of the errors with BMI in um, you know, the hydration and tumour mass as a measure in children with cancer. Okay, there's more questions there. Mike, and then I'll do Mike, uh, Stevens, and then Mark. Mike, do you want to go first? Uh, well, thank you. I mean, this is just to pick up on a comment that I saw in the chat, but it's relevant to the whole issue of obesity in cancer survivors. And of course, it's to remember that, that many of these patients also have substantial endocrinopathy. Um, uh, and and so so that the you know, the overweight is uh, is a multifactorial thing, 
and and that the primary impact of growth hormone sufficiency and so on is and needs to be considered in terms of its wider metabolic uh, consequences. Thank you, Mike. And I, and I think it's somewhat one of the challenges is how we bring together these different um, disciplines to study quite complex uh, conditions. Um, I, I'll take the next point from um, Mark. You have a, a point your hand is raised. Yeah, just to follow up on this discussion about metabolic health, I mean, um, this is something we don't even understand in adults yet, let alone children. Um, why there are certain people that have poor metabolic control, but they, they might be lean. And then there's also people who are overweight as classified by BMI who are perfectly metabolically healthy. So um, this is an area of quite intense research at the moment. I mean, there's a lot of hypotheses around kind of different fat distribution, fat around the organs, um, genetic factors, diet, physical activity. Um, so I think this is a, I mean, certainly for cancer and adults, adults, we know that probably metabolic health as determined by insulin, for example, might be a better predictor of cancer than just relying on BMI. Um, and whether that's applicable to, to children and young adults, I think is remains to be seen. But I mean, I think this is an area where there's a lot to be done. The microbiome also plays a role here. We know the microbiome can impact metabolic health and adiposity. So um, I think there's a lot to learn and possibly some of the insights we've got from adult studies could also be applicable in children, but, or maybe not. But I think there's also this point you raised about physical activity. I think the uh, physical activity and or fitness cardiovascular fitness may all each in themselves have these effects have multiple interacting effects and getting yeah. good tools that are standardized approaches to capturing some of this information I think is going to be key uh, Ronnie I'll take your point and then I had two related points uh, that relate to body composition Steve the first is that we have to be clear that fat free mass is not the same as lean mass Fat-free mass is lean mass plus bone mineral content. And lean mass is not the same as skeletal muscle mass. Skeletal muscle mass makes up the biggest fraction of lean mass, but it's not the same thing. And one can get a good measure of skeletal muscle mass by measuring appendicular lean mass. That is the lean mass in all four limbs. But there's another important point here that all fat is not the same. Most fat is subcutaneous fat, but there's a small proportion of total fat that is visceral fat that is much more metabolically active. And that component of total body fat has the opposite effect on bone from the preponderance of total body fat. So we've got to be careful about what we're talking about here in terms of the compartments of body composition. This comes back, Ronnie, to the point about actually having the technologies uh, or the, the methodologies available to us to start to break down some of these compartments. And then at the same time, thinking about how we might capture information with respect to these compartments using simpler tools that might be available, particularly in the low and middle income setting. There was a second point you wanted to make, Ronnie, or is that both points? The fact that from the... Points. Okay, thank you. Are there any other points anybody would like to... I think, Elena, you've got your... How do you raise your hand? Or is that a, is that a question or a point you'd like to make? No, I don't see the... Um, to, the I've got to raise your hand, but I want to. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you may. <laughs> so, um, I thank you. So I just wanted to um, just add, you know, all of the important insight that everyone has said about fat and fat-free mass and, and the importance with clinical outcomes. But I also, um, you know, think, and again, this kind of comes from a COG perspective is, you know, not only, okay, it, probably all likely will say that there's, it's associated with poor outcomes, but what is the mechanism behind that? So I think um, one opportunity is um, there's a bit of work looking at pharmacokinetics um, and its association between fat and fat mass. There's some work that's been published in ALL 
Um, there's some ongoing work in solid tumors. And, you know, I think, um, you know, tying it and linking it to something that's very uh, tangible that I think pediatric oncologists um, would appreciate and, and, and um, you know, would, would, we can modify and do something about it might help, you know, further advance this field forward. So just thinking about kind of mechanisms and underlying, you know, you know, um, outside of just with clinical outcomes, but exactly how is that changing clinical outcomes is important. I think absolutely. I think if we don't understand the mechanism that underlies the association, we run the danger of actually treating or intervening with a wrong target. And I think that's a critical point for us to better understand. And it links back to the point Ronnie was making. And certainly the mechanisms by which poor diet, lack of muscle, excess adiposity, um, inactivity, other imprudent dietary or lifestyle behaviors interact together, mm. you need to know whether they're operating through independent mechanisms or there's a single unifying mechanism through which many of these features are operating. And they may be different in the causation of cancer from the responses that may be, for example, to chemoradiation uh, therapy or chemotherapy or other forms of uh, intervention. Um, are there any other questions there? Sorry, it's very, di very difficult scanning, so, scanning such a large chorus. So if you bear with me while I look. Um, we have a, a, a few moments. So what I'd just like to run back to is some of the points. I mean, the purpose of this session was not for us to go through how you should treat children with cancer, children and young adults with cancer. It was really to say, look, we have all these different organizations operating in this space and how can we better work together in order to take this forward so i'm just going to ask each of our speakers in turn if we can take them in the order that we had them to really just reiterate their take-home message to the group and what it is that you think we could do better together than we can do individually so i'll start with mike what would you how would you advise us going forward what's your take home uh, well, my, my, my take home message is really to pick up on the, the comment I think that Erin made, which is there is a, a, an absolute need for some shared international guidance about the appropriate measurement and monitoring of nutritional status in children, both in high and low and middle income countries. And I think it's something that that we could do now. We don't need new research. I think we just need to apply what we know. And it might be that there are potentially better practices without necessarily being the best practice. And perhaps it would also help if in an implementation science framework, we could actually think about, well, what is it that we're, in, what is it that we're doing? The process side, as much as actually evaluating the impact of those into that care on nutritional state uh, and the outcome. But thank you, Mike. Can I just turn to Ronnie? Would you have a, a summary or take home message for us? Well, Steve, you challenged us at the beginning to come up with a single sentence. Uh, my single sentence is prioritize the challenges and collaborate on effecting the solutions. But if we get a bit more granular about that, I think this has been a really helpful event and it's a stimulus to those of us who are part and parcel of a number of different organizations to say, how can we better harmonize our efforts to bring about what we all want to achieve? So it seems to me the next step might be to say, how do the various organizations that have a role in this particular area of endeavor collaborate more effectively and in so doing bring about outcomes that we all want to achieve much more quickly. Thank you, Ronnie. I think we definitely would concur with that. And that's perhaps one of the, the roles of UICC and Iconic and the other organizations uh, going forward is how we can actually start to build something which is a broader community of practice that embraces everybody's interests, but also looks then to see how we can share that experience and that learning and then make it more accessible to everybody. Um, Mark, would you like to comment in terms of? 
your take home for us? Yeah, I mean, really following on from Ronnie, I mean, I would really push for kind of large scale collaborative studies, um, which um, collect uh, biological specimens and have good follow up of the patients um, and try to overcome some of these methodological challenges, for example, reliance on BMI um, and um, yeah, questionnaire data, which um, I mean, I purposely put that, um, that example of coffee and ALL in to show that um, relying on kind of self-report um, data, particularly in that context, is, is fought with biases and potential misclassifications. We really need kind of perspective studies with, with good nutritional data and preferentially um, biological markers as well. Thank you. And uh, Alexia? Yeah, so from the IEA's point of view, our, obviously our mandate is in using nuclear techniques and body composition and energy expenditure techniques. So um, we're you know, are happy to collaborate with any groups wanting to you know, bring together both the nutrition and pediatric cancer populations in low middle income countries to build this um, evidence and um, use these techniques to start informing some of our changes to clinical practice. And, and this prompt or prompt and the prompt to collaborate and invitation to collaborate is particularly important in those communities in whom uh, undernutrition is is evident, but perhaps do not necessarily engage most readily in some of these uh, these studies. Um, I, I have Vim and Erin. I understand that Wim's no longer with us. Uh, his computers had some problems. Uh, so Erin, would you like to sum up from your side? Yeah, I think from my, I think I'll weigh in from the practitioner side as well, which is I think my my challenge to all of us is taking what continuing to push the research, of course, but we know a lot, um, and I don't think it's been translated into practice yet. And so, how do we take everything that we know? about diet quality and body composition and, and how these things uh, impact both treatment as well as outcomes and how does that translate into practice? Because if I have a family who is still feeding their kid three milkshakes a day in order to prevent getting a nasogastric tube because that is their biggest fear right now, then we haven't, we haven't translated our messaging very well. And so I, I think taking what we know and putting that into packageable messaging for all providers and for all families. Um, and I, I, I think that was something that was coming up in the chat as well. So that, that comes back to that. So, um, and the last two, Elena and Karina, last couple of quick comments. Yeah, I'd like to expand what, what Aaron was saying. That's uh, exactly what I was thinking about, about being able to translate um, information to to cl the, the clinic to a day-to-day -day work, especially when talking about um, body composition and the best way to assess patients, uh, especially in the LMIC settings, uh, on how we can realistically do this and and be able to do the best diagnosis that we can to our patients. So harmonizing care and actually capturing information in routine care so that we can then actually exactly. learn as we go through the experience. And Elena? Exactly. I mean, I, I think everyone's hit on the main points. Um, harmonizing care to me is first. Um, that's what IPAN really starts with because um, that gives you the platform to do research. Um, and I, I, again, we're, we're much stronger and can ask more provocative questions in larger numbers. So, you know, all of us have so many amazing uh, groups and centers set up. So, you know, combining collective efforts, using the cooperative groups to the best we can um, is a real, you know, would be a real leap forward for all of us. Well, thank you for that. Um... So we've come to the end of our time. I would just like to say that if there are any points that were raised in the chat that we haven't addressed, don't worry, we we're gonna review the chat later and we'll come back with some uh, responses to the points that you're making. Um, we're hoping that through this, uh, this conversation today, we perhaps have raised the issue of uh, pediatric oncology from a nutritional perspective to the, the forefront of people's attention and we hope that we'll continue to uh, engage with you as we go forward. 
if you have any specific questions to any of the speakers um, or to us in general, please feel free to contact UICC and they'll make sure that they pass them on so we can share and respond to that. Um, this is the first of three um, virtual dialogues we're offering through UICC. Um, the, sub the next one is going to be in the area of optimizing care in terms of a technique we call prehabilitation, which embraces all aspects of a, 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 an individual's well-being from nutrition, physical, um, their, their activity and fitness, and their psychological well-being. So that's going to be the next uh, topic we're going to offer up as a dialogue. And please uh, look out for that. And we'll keep you uh, involved in the conversation. So thank you, everybody, for coming and joining us today. Thank you very much to Shalini and the team at UICC for looking after us. Uh, and thank you very much to our speakers who've joined us today to share their thoughts with you. And thank you for your contributions as well. Uh, please stay well, stay safe. And I hope to see you all again at some point in the future. Thank you very much, everybody.